All right, so let's talk about a couple of examples of understanding the core experience. And I've got two examples here that we've talked about a couple of times, but let's go over it one more time. The first one is NASCAR versus the NHRA, and the second is Zion versus the Grand Canyon. All right, so um, at, at the first glance, NASCAR and the NHRA look like direct competitors and they look like they're offering the same core experience. That is automobile racing. Now the, the vehicles are a little bit different, but in fact, they're both racing cars in one form or another. Well, it turns out if you, if you dig a little deeper and look at these, it turns out that they are not really direct competitors because they offer different core experiences. I got a job uh, doing some consulting work for the NHRA in the um, in the late 90s, uh, and we were the, the NHRA was actually jealous of NASCAR because that was this was right after NASCAR had sort of became a mainline um, entertainment venue. Prior to that time, NASCAR was really mostly a southern sport. And Northerners would watch the uh, Daytona 500 early in the year because there wasn't much else on TV, and it was and 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 the NASCAR event was on. But in the 90s, NASCAR did a great job of broadening their appeal to a very traditional middle-class mainstream uh, audience across the country. And then, and the NHRA really was not able to do that. And so, when the when when I got tied up with the NHRA, they were truly jealous of NASCAR, and they wanted to actually do the same thing that NASCAR did. That is, bring their their entertainment venue and entertainment promise to Middle America. And in fact, in some ways, it was more uh, closely related to the way middle Americans thought about cars than NASCAR. Now, <clears throat> NASCAR is a racing venue and it its core experience is racing, automobile racing. Now, these cars race at over 200 miles an hour and over the in when you know when I was just a child and watched NASCAR, every NASCAR car was in fact a production car that was stripped down a, a, a steel uh, roll bar cage was put in and they would race one brand of car against another. That brand of car's engine, that brand of car's design and shape and everything else. Today, that is really not the case. Today, all of the cars use the same shells. They all have very similar engines. It's not like they're using an engine that is a production engine for their automobiles in general. Um, and and they, and they all follow exactly the same rules. Now, this is done because NASCAR is selling racing. And the one thing that NASCAR cannot have is a finish to a race where one car is a lap or two laps ahead of all the others. That really isn't a race, and people go home disappointed. What people want to see at the end of an automobile race, after they've sat in the sun for four hours, eating turkey legs, uh, um, inhaling the, um, the 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 spent fuel fumes um, and uh, and getting a sunburn is they want to see two or three or four or five cars race flat out for the finish line. And so NASCAR does an interesting thing. They change the rules every single week, and they change the rules for every single track. And the purpose behind that is to make sure that every brand of automobile that the sponsors use, uh, and, the, and, the, and the brands tend to be um, Fords uh, and Toyotas and Chevrolets, I think, um, uh, they, um, they want to make sure that each of those brands and the sponsors behind those brands have an equal opportunity of winning. And they never want to see one set of cars get to be much faster and better than the other sets of cars. Now, 
and so they are truly in the automobile racing business, and they will even stop a race late in the race to make sure that all the cars get lined up and so that they have another full race. They do the same thing now in NASCAR by having three parts to every race. And so they have three shorter races that then result in the last big finish race. But the idea behind that is there is then there are more races and more winners and 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 they can claim um, um, and they can claim for their sponsors more victories in one way or another. Now the NHRA is really all about the traditional way that many of us think about automobiles when we drive around town, and that is. We're at the stoplight and someone else pulls up alongside us at the stoplight and we both rev our engines a little bit. And then when the light turns green, we step on the gas and see which one can take off faster. That is, in fact, a layman's version of a drag race. And the NHRA decided many, many years ago when they when they developed the National Hot Rod Association to take that particular activity and move it to a racetrack where it would be safer and more um, regulated and and then they turned it into a spectator sport uh, to the point now where the fastest cars you can see here I have a, I have a picture of a, uh, a top fuel dragster that the they, they will go over 300 miles an hour in a quarter mile that is they will get their speed up and it'll be, you know, 3.3 seconds or 3.2 seconds or whatever. And they will be up to 300 miles an hour in that short period of time. And it, and if you go and watch these, these automobiles in person, it is absolutely astonishing. But the problem, of course, is that the NHRA, and, and when I went and saw the NHRA in Pomona, I was under the impression that they were also selling racing because, after all, when you're at that stoplight and the other person pulls up along you at the stoplight, the goal is to take off faster and stay ahead of the other person until you get to the next stoplight. That's racing. But the NHRA really sells speed. And, and that is flat out raw speed. How fast can my car go in 1,000 yards or 1,000 feet rather? Um, so how fast can my car go? And so while NASCAR sells racing, the NHRA sells speed. And, and as a result, if you want the NHRA uh, to get better, they have to figure out a way to show people how fast that speed is. In fact, I, I worked for about a year with them trying to figure out a way to demonstrate on television how fast these cars are going. When you watch a NASCAR event on television, you get a sense of how fast these cars are going. Um, they're going 200 miles an hour, and that is really fast. But the NHRA cars are going 330 miles an hour, and that's really fast in 1,000 feet. But when you watch an NHRA event on television, it is, it is not easy to figure out and to identify and to experience how fast those cars are going. We spent six months moving cameras around, putting them in the cars, behind the cars, in front of the cars, in the middle of the track, on the side of the track, under the track, over the track, trying to figure out a way to film these cars going down the drag strip and at the same time capturing how fast they're going. We could never figure out how to do that. And to this day, the uh, uh, NHRA drag racing is sort of relegated to high cable stations. Where NASCAR is what it's you know it's a it's a standard on Fox uh, on the on on Fox Network every single uh, Saturday or Sunday, and in fact uh, we just recently had um, the uh, the NASCAR race here in Las Vegas. So with the NHRA, it was always a struggle because they were selling speed and we could never demonstrate how fast it is. But an NHRA and a, a event in person is dramatically different and dramatically more exciting than, see, than, than watching one on television. You can actually feel the cars as they accelerate and make, and, and make the noise as, they, as their horsepower builds up torque. 
Um, NASCAR is also a different experience when you go to the NASCAR track. It's an all-day activity at the NASCAR track. Um, and, you know, and it's four hours typically out in the sun, and it's eating uh, uh, roasted turkey legs and, and, uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, but it's all great fun. NAS but NASCAR is a different experience than the NHRA experience. And so those two experiences, while they look like they are about the same core experience, they simply are not. Another good example of how this works is a comparison of the Zion National Park in Utah and the Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. Now, these are both national parks, and you might argue that they, that they have the same experience, a national park experience. But they are not the same experiences, and, they, and, and, and there is no real way to compare the two experiences if you've been to both Zion and the Grand Canyon. Now, the Grand Canyon, here I have a picture of the Grand Canyon on the left. Uh, and the Grand Canyon is really about one of the seven wonders of the world, natural wonders of the world. It is, in fact, the Grand Canyon, the grandest of them all. And here you can see I have a picture here of the Grand Canyon from the South Rim. And these people are looking across at the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. They're standing in Arizona, but they're looking over into Utah. Now, the whole experience of the Grand Canyon is to see something that you can never see anywhere else. And that is a breathtaking, unbelievable view. Now, you can hike down into the Grand Canyon, but most of the people who hike down into the Grand Canyon realize after uh, six or seven or eight hundred yards or maybe a, maybe a one mile hike down into the Grand Canyon, uh, that it is going to be completely uphill coming out of the Grand Canyon. And so for many of them, uh, as far as down into the Grand Canyon as they get is maybe three or four or five hundred feet. Most of the time is spent looking at the view. Now, Zion is got wonderful views, beautiful views. And here you can see a view of the Virgin River um, uh, at Zion. And this young man is hiking out onto the end of the Angel's Landing, which is a peak out on one of the on one of the cliffs that overlooks all of the Virgin River Canyon. And you can see that to hike out there, he's on a very narrow path where on his right hand side is probably a, a five or six or seven or eight hundred foot fall. And on his left hand side is, in fact, a chain that he's hanging on to to make sure that if he stumbles or anything, he doesn't fall off of that edge. Now, Zion also has an, an area of hiking called the Narrows, which is where the Virgin River goes up tightly between two canyons. And you can hike up the Virgin River and you can get up to, oh, you know, maybe neck deep in water. Uh, as you hike up through the as you hike up through the narrows of the of the uh, of the Virgin River, um, and it's a nice hike. It's it's a it's a hike for people who are um, uh, who are afraid of heights because there's no heights in that particular one as compared to the Zion National Park. So the Zion experience is really all about hiking. You really can't enjoy Zion unless you're willing to get out of the car and hike some places. Sure, you can see things and everything, but the but the true core experience at Zion is hiking. One of my favorite stories about Zion was I was there with my uh, with my nephews and one of my nephews and myself were out hiking and we'd been hiking for about an hour. And we were hiking, hiking, hiking and and I was thinking to myself, we are probably at a place in Utah in 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 Zion National Park where very, very few people have ever been before. And, and there's something that was something sort of uh, exhilarating about that thought. And then we walked around a corner and there was a, a Coke machine chained to a, um, a tree. So it turns out that maybe we hadn't gotten quite as far as we thought we had gotten and maybe weren't that far off the beaten path. One is a viewing experience and the other is a hiking experience. Two grand, two uh, national parks, two very different experiences. Once you're able to identify the core experience, you can design it, you can stage it, you can manage it, you can enhance it, and you can create a competitive advantage that is very difficult for any of your competition to copy.